Prince Edward's coronation was fixed for Sunday the 20th of February 1547. Several young nobles were traditionally admitted to the Order of the Bath, including my two sons, Henry and Charles. The banquet following the ceremony would normally have lasted 12 hours. However, due to the new king's young age, this was reduced to seven hours, so to not unduly weary him. With no queen currently residing with the king, my services were not required at court, so after the coronation, I returned to Grimsthorpe with my sons. It was here I learned about the death of my old friend and mistress, Catherine Parr. Catherine had married Thomas Seymour in 1547 with my blessing. Some considered it inappropriate, but I knew that they had been courting before King Henry had proposed, and I thought it only fair that a woman should be allowed to remarry, should she feel inclined a pleasure I was denied through my husband's last will. Catherine had recently given birth to their first child, a daughter, who they named Mary, but like so many mothers, had fallen ill and died only days later. Less than six months later, Thomas Seymour was arrested and charged with treason, and in March 1549 he was executed, leaving his young daughter an orphan. Seymour's dying wish, and on recommendation from his deceased wife, was that the child be brought up at Grimsthorpe. History has often said that I was unwilling to take care of the child and resented her. This is not true. I was honoured that they trusted me to care for their child, and little Mary cannot be held responsible for what happened to her parents. What I did resent was that I was not financially supported to raise her. The Duke of Somerset had led me to believe that I would receive an allowance for her from her father's confiscated lands to pay for her upkeep. However, no money was ever received. As a late Queen's daughter, she had her own household, which included a governess, a nurse, two maids and many other servants. I was expected to pay for their salaries and that of my own household, as well as provide food and rooms for them, not to mention clothing and nursery plate for such a high-born infant, which included several items of silver, quilts, feather beds, sheets, hangings, carpets and cloth of gold pillows. I was a widow with no job at court, and though reasonably well provided for by my late husband, I simply did not have the funds to support the little girl. Both fortunately and unfortunately, the child was sickly and did not survive very long. After her death, I dismissed her household and concentrated on providing for my own children. In 1550, I decided that my son should complete their education at St John's College in Cambridge, a decision that would give them many opportunities, but also one that I would live to regret for the rest of my days. My boys were clever, funny and chivalrous. After their father's death, we had become very close, and I decided to rent a house in Kingston, a village five or six miles away from the college so I could be near them. As they prepared to depart, I ensured they were given the very best clothing, made of silks, satins and velvets, trimmed in fur and silver embroidery and decorated with rubies, diamonds and emeralds. I wanted their station and lineage to be unmistakable. But illness does not separate the rich from the poor, and in 1551 my beautiful boys died from sweating sickness within hours of each other. I was unwell myself when my sons fell ill, but I was determined to be at their bedside to nurse them. Despite my immediate rush to them, Henry, my eldest son, died before I could reach him. I was able to comfort Charles in his last moments, but whether he knew I was there or not is unknown. The loss of both my sons was another devastating blow. We buried them in the church there with all the heraldic splendour to which they were entitled to, 
but the loss weighed heavy on my heart. And their departure from this world drained me both physically and mentally. However, more loss would soon follow. On the death of the Duke of Suffolk's heirs, Tattershall and other properties granted to my husband and his male issue automatically reverted to the crown, meaning my income was drastically reduced. I did not resent this, as it meant I had less upkeep to worry about. However, it saddened me to know that the properties and lands my Lord Suffolk had worked so hard to acquire could be so easily removed from me. With my sons dead, I no longer had to worry about their inheritance, and feeling very much alone and in need of some comfort, I decided to defy my husband's last wishes and marry for a second time. The man I chose was considered beneath my station, but had many charms and recommendations upon him. Richard Bertie had been my gentleman usher for many years. He was a steadfast Protestant who had acquired a Bachelor of Arts degree from Corpus Christi College in Oxford and was fluent in French, Latin and Italian. I had grown quite attached to this man, who now shouldered so much of the burden of running Grimsthorpe, and who had supported me through my grief. So, in 1552, we were married. With a Protestant king on the throne, surrounded by Protestant councillors and my Protestant husbands, things were finally looking up. However, tragedy soon struck our golden boy king, and in turn England, when the child contracted tuberculosis and died in July 1553. Before his death, King Edward knew that the throne would pass to his sister Mary, a staunch Catholic. Edward did not want Mary to convert England back to the old faith, and neither did his councillors, so at the Duke of Northumberland's suggestion, he proclaimed that upon his death, the throne would pass to Lady Jane Grey, the daughter of Francis Grey, whom I had grown up with before I eventually became her stepmother after marrying her father Charles, which, aged just 34, made me step-grandmother to a queen. Needless to say, had Jane been queen for more than ten days, I would certainly have been invited back to court. However, we both knew that the crown rightfully belonged to Princess Mary and that she would make it hers at whatever cost. Pregnant with mine and Richard's first child, I sat at Grimsthorpe anxiously awaiting news from London. As expected, Mary marched on London. Soon, Lady Jane Grey was denounced and Princess Mary was proclaimed Queen Jane willingly relinquished the crown and was escorted to the Tower of London, where she remained, in reasonable comfort, for many months. However, shortly after my daughter's birth, Mary's council insisted that young Jane would remain a threat to Mary's crown if left alive, and under building pressure from them, she finally signed Jane's death warrant. The execution appalled me, but I could do nothing to prevent it. With Mary on the throne, I was deeply concerned for my family and our religion, and I had good reason to be.